before we leave the topic of hope, I want to talk about just as a psychologist, you know, that's what Leslie and I do. We're both psychologists. And to think about it from theological terms, you know, in the church, we like to call it hope. In psychological studies, it's called optimism. And I, I want to talk just briefly about this because I think it's so helpful to so many people in understanding how God designed us for hope. Hope does not mean eliminating worry. Mm -hmm. And so many people in the church especially feel guilty because, oh, I still worry and, and uh, I want to be a person of hope and so forth. It doesn't necessarily eliminate that. In fact, let me tell you real quickly about a, a, a really fascinating study that was done in Pennsylvania back in the 70s. A fellow by the name of, of Martin Seligman was doing this study on dogs. And he had this thing called a shuttle box where he put a dog on one side of a box and a little partition. And the, the study was to see how many trials would it take for a dog to learn to avoid a little minor shock, the kind you'd get like on a winter day when you touch a doorknob. Uh, and and how, how long would it take for that dog to learn he could jump over the little partition and avoid the shock if it was associated with a sound, a buzzer or something like that, all right? Have you ever heard of this study before? No, no, no I've never, no. So this is fascinating. So he, he was doing this study. He was just out of graduate school and he was and it was in time of behaviorism and stuff like that. And so he's doing all these trials. And so a little buzzer would go off and a little shock would kind of come into the grate on this little shuttle box thing. And the dog would then, to avoid it, jump over the little side to a carpeted piece of the box. How many trials do you think it would take most dogs to learn? Oh, there's that buzzer. I think I'm out of here and jump over. Don't try I mean, this at home. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> On average, it would take a dog about three trials to associate that buzzer okay. with wow. that egg experience. All right. And then just jump over. But he had a handful of dogs that weren't getting it like six times, 12 times, 18 times. The buzzer, buzzer was going up. And eventually these dogs were just sitting down and taking the little shock. And he was like, what's going on with these dogs? And he began to consult with some of his colleagues and realized that these were dogs that were used in another experiment where the shock was on the other side of the shuttle box. Oh, my okay. goodness. And he discovered what he came to call these dogs had fallen victim to what he called learned helplessness. You've heard that phrase before, learned helplessness. This is where it comes from. And these dogs learned it didn't matter what I did, I, I couldn't get out of this situation. And so they gave up all hope, as it were. Well, Dr. Seligman spent his entire professional career, eventually became the president of the American Psychological Association because it was so kind of shifting in, in such a positive way in psychology to study these things. But he, he spent his entire adult career studying learned helplessness, not in dogs, but in people, wow. in people just like you and me. And here's what he discovered. For all of us in the midst of this COVID crisis hmm. that are suffering from depression, that are suffering from anxiety, that might even have harmful thoughts or, or, or just, just you know things that we don't even want to fathom, everybody that's falling into that is leaning into these three things. First of all, they're seeing the experience as pervasive. In other words, this is going to impact everything forever. Hmm. And that's a really you know, talk about causing anxiety or depression, right? That's not hope giving. This is going to negatively impact everything, everything. forever. So that's pervasive. The, yeah. Personal. Personal, as in not that this is something that's happening to all of us, and I'm a part of that, but this is something happening to me, right. and there's something more. There's something more difficult for me, or I've done something. There's something defective about me. It's my fault right. that I've lost my job in the midst of COVID, or I don't know how to provide, or I'm struggling to stay. Or that we didn't have a safety fund in place, right. or, or whatever it might be. And so you personalize it. That right. that compounds the depression. That that heightens the anxiety. And then the third one, so so pervasive and personal, and then the, the third one is permanence. Hmm. It's always going to be that there's nothing I can do about it. It's just, and so you just give up. Right. Now, when a person grabs onto those three things, clinically, we say they become depressed. There's no way around it, right? Because it's pervasive, it's permanent, and it's personal. 
those are the things that involve learned helplessness. And so whatever and it happens to people as easily as it does, yes. of course, to those precious little dogs, sometimes because we've had a life shaping event in our story that has caused us right. to lose hope. Right. And, and that's those are the people we want right. to speak to right now. And, and by the way, a, a great classic example of this, we were at Auschwitz two years ago, I guess, yeah. when we could get on airplanes and travel. Remember those days? <laughs> I do. And Back in the we, day. Yeah, I know. And so we, we had this family trip and, and we were in Germany. We thought we, we want to go experience what was this like? A very right? sobering thing. And, yes. and uh, I knew just from studying this whole concept of learned helplessness that so many people in those camps fell victim to that too because what they discovered near the end of the war that there was actually holes and fences and stuff where people could literally have escaped, but they didn't even try anymore. They just wow. gave up, right? They became hopeless. And it's so tempting to do that when we're faced with strife, when we're faced with stress and anxiety like we are right now in this pandemic. There's so much that is beyond our control. And by the way, psychologically, that's why people are going out and buying incredible amounts of toilet paper. <laughs> it makes no rational sense, yeah, wow. right? Wow. No rational sense. But they, it's a sense of control, right? Well, at least I'm going to have this, right? I don't even know why. It could have been peanut butter. It could have been any number of things. It just happened to be that but we're looking for that sense of control. And so we grasp at silly things to, to make that sense happen. But I'm telling you, learned helplessness is something that if you tap into the power of the Holy Spirit in your life, that's when you begin to, to transcend learned helplessness. And you learn optimism, you learn hope. And that's what we're talking about. That's what the, you know, the by when, when Paul talked about hope, that's what he was talking about, was that capacity to transcend. It's not a personal, it's not pervasive, it's not permanent. We have a hope in Christ that helps us move beyond that. Let me ask you a question then. Um, the, the three things that you just described, do you suggest somebody start tackling them kind of one at a time? That's a great question. And the answer, in so many ways has to do with tuning into the single most important conversation that you ever have. You had it yesterday and you're gonna have it tomorrow and you're having it right now and you even have this conversation while you're asleep because it's your internal dialogue, it's your self-talk. That conversation has so much to do with how we feel and what we say and how we behave. And most of us don't even give it a thought because it's a silent conversation, right? Our self-talk, that internal dialogue. What if, what if before you fell asleep tonight, you could take a little computer chip out of the back of your head and plug it into your laptop <laughs> and it would tabulate your internal dialogue for the last 24 hours. Wow. And, and it would drop it into one of two categories, either positive self-talk or negative self-talk. Which one of those buckets would be most full for you at the end of any given? Yeah. You know, that's kind of a scary thought, right? But if you're like most people, 73, 73, 74% of our self-talk would fall into that negative bucket. And we know this from research at UCLA, by the way. Uh, this isn't just armchair psychology. We know this. Um, and so not the, per the person that has a lock on what I like to call your profound significance, that, that God loves you as if you're the only person on the planet to love. That, you know, St. Augustine said that. When you get a grip on that, when you get a lock on that, and it's not just words, you know, because if you're like me and you grew up in the church and you sang, Jesus loves me, this I know, and you memorize Romans 8, and you sing about God's amazing grace, you can do all that with your, you know, cerebral kind of capacity. But to feel it deep down in your bones, that God loves me as if I'm the only person on the planet to love, that's when your internal dialogue begins to change. Mm -hmm. And so I'm not, I'm not discounting any kind of treatment or medication that we might need to, to help us when it comes to things like real intense depression or, or serious anxiety. But I'm talking about the kind that, that we have in the midst of this that almost all of us can fall victim to. We've got to tune into our self-talk. What are those tapes that we're playing in our head that are driving us to keep saying, oh yeah, this is personal, this is this is pervasive, and this is permanent. 
the gift that happens with understanding our self-talk is awareness, yes. right? Because then we become aware of what's happening inside of us that's creating that experience of anxiety right. or fear. And, and awareness, as we psychologists like to say, is curative. Once you become aware of something, then you can do something. Right. I can say to my 16-year-old, I can go into his bedroom and go, hey, Jackson, this bed, this like bedroom is a mess. And he'll look okay. around and go, it is? Oh yeah, I guess it is. I'll try to clean it up a little, right? Just you have to have a level of awareness before you yeah. begin to change something. And so that's what, if you tune into your self-talk and really hear what are you saying, because it often has to do with the, the tapes you were programmed to say to yourself from the home you grew up in. If you can tune into that, it's the first step towards finding that path toward well-being and wholeness in the midst of this thing. And I gotta be honest, I don't know how you do this on your own. You, you've got to lean into the Holy Spirit to help you mm -hmm. in your capacity to become so, you know, just to become aware of this self-talk. So then you can begin to change that and get out of this personal, pervasive, and permanent cycle.